All right, welcome to the jilting of Granny Weatherall. Uh, so I put the text on pretty large on the screen in case you're on a phone or something like that. Um, but of course, you can also uh, print the text and annotate as we go. Uh, I encourage you actually to give it a read first if you can, and then come through a second time here. Um, uh, you can also just kind of uh, open up the text on a different browser or a different window um, and just kind of listen to the audio here, uh, you know, kind of depending on your circumstance and conditions and so forth. Um, all right, so I'm going to read through this and pause from time to time to point out things that, uh, you know, I'm thinking about or that I would annotate uh, in, in, in reading this. All right, and again, this is all uh, geared towards uh, analyzing a character, uh, geared towards the prose uh, essay on the exam, um, and the type of reading you want to be doing as you're reading uh, throughout the year, thinking about the things that you're reading, uh, particularly the characterization and the novels that you have. All right, I always say first thing you should do is start with the title, okay? And so this is called The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. Uh, and so jilting, if you're not familiar with that word, you can go look it up. Um, and the context of using it here is left at the altar. And so apparently at some point in the past that people, um, well, I know because I've read it, but uh, don't know about is that Granny Weatherall was left at the altar. She was there in her wedding dress, the priest was there, and the guy never showed she was jilted at the altar. Um, now, it's titled that, and so we gotta think about, you know, keep that in mind, because it's gonna be about another jilting too. Uh, Granny Weatherall, that name too. Names are often important in literature. So Weatherall, um, that's, that's kind of an obvious one, right? She's a tough character. Uh, she's been through some stuff, she's weathered a lot, and so um, that has kind of formed who she is, and she's not always the nicest of people. Um, but I think we'll, we'll reach a point where, uh, you know, we, we don't like her, but we also sympathize with her at the same time. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and start, start reading and, uh, I'll pause, uh, to make comments here and there. And you're welcome to, of course, um, annotate on your own text if you can, if, if you cannot, that's okay. Uh, like I said, in a recent announcement, there'll be lots of different ways for you to, um, show me what you've learned this quarter. Uh, so, you know, if just taking notes in a notebook works great. Um, if printing out and writing on it is, is a great way if, if you have that ability. Um, or, you know, just cut and paste the text into a, a document and, you know, type in your annotations. All very good options. Okay. She flicked her wrist neatly out of Dr. Harry's pudgy, careful fingers and pulled the sheet up to her chin. The brat ought to be in knee breeches. Doctoring around the country with spectacles on her, his nose. Get along now. Take your school books and go. There's nothing wrong with me. All right. And so like I said before, uh, that one um, sentence, the bread ought to be in knee breeches, that's vocalization. That's the narrator talking still. Yeah, the last quote is Granny Weatherall. And right from the beginning, we, we get, she's, she's a little salty, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with me, too. Just start a, 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 a story like that with a the doctor there. Well, clearly there is something wrong. Um, and we're always looking for dual meanings, right? Maybe it's not just physical that she's talking about here. Dr. Harry spread a warm paw like a cushion on her forehead, where the forked green vein danced and made her eyelids twitch. Now, now, be a good girl, and we'll have you up in no time. All right, now this has told me a lot about Dr. Harry. Two paragraphs in a row, they mentioned his you know, pudgy fingers and his warm paw. Um, and then when he speaks, he speaks very condescendingly to this this clearly old woman, right? Because the imagery around her with the fork green veins and so forth and her twitching eyelids, um, you know, she's pretty infirm, not in the best of shape. But uh, that, that condescension, I don't think she's going to like that. That's no way to speak to a woman nearly 80 years old just because she's down. I'd have you respect your elders, young man. And, and even phrases like young man really kind of like characterizes Granny Weather all there, right? Well, Missy, excuse me, Dr. Harry patted her cheek. But I've got to warn you, haven't I? You are a marvel. But you must be careful, or you're going to be good and sorry. Again, more of that condescension from the doctor. Um, you know, and, and so those of you going into health services, this is something that will actually come up with some of our readings, uh, are you know, the ethics here and things like this. And so um, if that's something that you're attuned to, that's something you're going to think about. Like, is this good bedside manner? It seems comforting, but maybe it's not. Um, other, others of us who don't have an interest in that aren't going that way, aren't going to think that way. Uh, we, we maybe will remember, you know, the, the mean old woman down the street. But even those connections, and I'll share one of mine later on, uh, are important. 
you're not going to write about them in a formal analytical essay, but they will tap into experiences and emotions and things like that that the author is trying to get into. And so identifying those personal connections can also help you get to the meaning of uh, the text itself. You have to be careful because biases can come with that too, um, but I just thought I'd point that out. All right, so condescending doctor. Uh, don't tell me what I'm going to be. I'm on my feet now, morally speaking. It's Cornelia. I had to go to bed to get rid of her. Okay, so she thinks Cornelia is annoying. Um, she thinks that she's stronger, perhaps, than she really is at this particular moment. Her bones felt loose and floated around in her skin, and Dr. Harry floated like a balloon around the foot of the bed. He floated and pulled down his waistcoat and swung his glasses on a cord. Well, stay where you are. It certainly can't hurt you. All right, so some interesting imagery again in this paragraph. Her bones felt loose and floated around her skin. Uh, one, you know, we you see, you see an old person that might like kind of like what they look like, just like a bag of bones. Um, but then even this, uh, you know, simile comparing to a balloon, um, there is perhaps this going back to a childhood kind of state. And so maybe she is acting childlike at times. Maybe there's a reason why Dr. Harry is using that language. Um, and, and, in, and in fact, we're going to find out that, you know, she's got some dementia and she, she is going back to past times in her, in her mind. Um, if you're playing, paying really close attention, you might realize that, well, he just gave her a sedative. And, and that's why uh, she's feeling that kind of way. Um, all right. Get along and doctor, you're sick, said Granny Weatherall. Leave a well woman alone. I'll call for you uh, when I want to. Sorry. Um, where were you 40 years ago when I pulled through milk leg and double pneumonia? You weren't even born. Don't let Cornelia lead you on, she shouted, because Dr. Harry appeared to float to the ceiling and, and out. I pay my own bills and I don't throw my money around on nonsense, she says. All right. Um, again, she's trying to th show like just how strong-willed she is, right? She's trying to weather all, after all, um, and you know, is having trouble being vulnerable at this moment. She meant to wave goodbye, but it was too much trouble. Her eyes closed them of themselves. It was like a dark curtain drawn around the bed. The pillow rose and floated under her, pleasant as a hammock in a light wind. She listened to the leaves rustling outside the window. No, somebody was swishing the newspapers. No, Cornelia and Dr. Harry were whispering together. She leaped broad awake, thinking they whispered in her ear. All right, so this trying to you know, figure out what the sound is. And, um, you know, if they're off in the corner whispering, it must be something serious. You know, yeah, she's on her deathbed. She was never like this. Never like this. Well, what can we expect? Yes, 80 years old. Well, and what if she was? She still had ears. It was like Cornelia to whisper around doors. She always kept things secret in such a public way. She was always being tactful and kind. Cornelia was dutiful. That was the trouble with her. Dutiful and good. So good and dutiful, said Granny. That I'd like to spank her. She saw herself spanking Cornelia, making a fine job of it. All right, so there's a good example of uh, Granny Weatherall, like, kind of going towards the past. You know, if she's 80, Cornelia is a grown woman, you know, in, in, in charge of things right now. Uh, but she's kind of, like, floating back to uh, when she was the mom who could give Cornelia a good spanking. Um, and then and we see some of the um, maybe bitterness that she has towards her own daughter here as well. What would you say, Mother? Granny felt her face tying up in not hard knots. Can't a body think? I'd like to know. I thought you might want something. I do. I want a lot of things. First off, go away and don't whisper. She lay and drowsed, hoping in her sleep that the children would keep out and let her rest a minute. It had been a long day. Now that she was tired, it was always pleasant to snatch a minute now and then. There was always so much to be done. Let me see. Tomorrow. All right, again, it's sort of double meaning, right? There's there's a lot of things that just to get done, and she's really focused on that. Has she finished everything, right? And so all these, like, Physical things can also talk about like her life. Like, is is she ready? Um, and so uh, maybe tomorrow I'll finish. Tomorrow was far away, and there was nothing to trouble about. Things were finished somehow when a time came. Thank God there was always a little margin over for peace. Then a person could spread out the pl plan of life and tuck in the ed edges orderly. It was good to have everything clean and folded away, with the hair brushes and tonic bottles sitting straight on the white embroidered linen. The day started without fuss, and the pantry shelves laid out with rows of jelly glasses and brown jugs and white stone china jars with blue whirligigs and words painted on them, coffee, tea, sugar, ginger, cinnamon, allspice, and the bronze clock with a lion on top, nicely dusted off. The dust that lion could collect in 24 hours. All right, so she's going back again in, in 
in time in her mind, right? Um, and to all these like household chores that she's done and, and so forth. And so uh, she's lamenting that. Now this part is really important. The box in the attic with all those letters tied up. Well, she'd have to go through that tomorrow. All those letters, George's letters and John's letters and her letters to them both, lying around for the children to find afterwards made her uneasy. Yes, that would be tomorrow's business. No use to let them know how silly she had once been. All right, so this is huge, all right? Using a word like silly, that diction, uh, goes back to that sort of condescension that she rails against earlier where she's acting like a child. Uh, but then she says, you know, maybe, maybe I kind of am. But you notice that like she's, uh, this is a task for tomorrow. She can't quite get to it uh, and she's worried about it. Um, you know, and tomorrow might not come. But notice that the letters in the attic, there's two men, George and John. And she's worried about the children finding them. Ooh, that's, she's opened a little scandal here, isn't she? Uh, and so we got to figure out, well, what's, what is it? What's going on? Um, but also, this next sentence, while she was rummaging around, she found death in her mind, and it felt clammy and unfamiliar. Well, uh, that, that attic, right, isn't just the physical part of the house, but also it's her mind. It's the deep recesses, the things that she's, uh, kind of locked away and not let people at. All right, so those letters aren't just in the literal attic of the house, but they're also uh, in her head. Um, and so now we're going back in time in that head uh, into the, the spooky parts of the brain with the cobwebs and stuff like that. She had spent so much time preparing for death, there was no need for bringing it up again. Let it take care of itself now. When she was 60, she had felt very old, finished, and went around making farewell trips to see her children and grandchildren. With a secret in her mind, this is the very last of your mother, children. Then she made her will and came down with a long fever. That was all just a notion, like a lot of other things, but it was lucky too, for she had once and uh, for all got over the idea of dying for a long time. Now she couldn't be worried. She hoped she had better sense now. Her father had lived to be 102 years old and had drunk a noggin of hot, strong hot toddy on his last birthday. He told the reporters it was his daily habit, and he owed his long life to that. He made quite a scandal and was very pleased about it. She believes she just uh, uh, played Cornelia a little bit. And so again, she wants to actually like, torment her, her daughter there. Uh, but that, that hot toddy, if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a drink that has like tea and whiskey in it. And uh, so if he says that like the reason why he lived to be over 100 was because of whiskey, that was scandalous back in the day, you know. Um, all right. And so again, she's still insisting that she's as strong as she was in life. Um, she didn't die then when she was ready. She's not going to die now. Um, and so there's this question over just how ready she really is. Cornelia, Cornelia, no footsteps, but a sudden hand, sorry, no footsteps, I should say, but a sudden hand on her cheek. Bless you. Where have you been? Here, mother. Well, Cornelia, I want a noggin of hot toddy. Okay, there's that association thing. We got the stream of consciousness going around. She went back to a distant memory and then she brought it forward. Uh, are you cold, darling? I'm chilly, Cornelia. Lying in bed stops the circulation. I must have told you that a thousand times. Well, she could just hear Cornelia telling her husband that uh, mother was getting a little childish and they'd have to humor her. The thing that most annoyed her was that Cornelia thought she was deaf, dumb, and blind. Little hasty glances and tiny gestures tossed around her and over her head saying, Don't cross her. Let her have her way. She's 80 years old. And she's sitting there as if she lived in a thin glass cage. Sometimes Granny almost made up her mind to pack up and move back to her own house where nobody could remind her every minute that she was old. Wait, wait, Cornelia! To your own children, whisper behind your back. Oh, man, she's bitter. All right. Doop, 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 doop. In her days, she had kept a better house and had a lot more work done. So again, man, Cornelia cannot win. She's not even a good enough housekeeper. She wasn't too old yet for Lydia to be driving 80 miles for advice when one of the children jumped the track and Jimmy still dropped in and talked things over. Now, Mammy, uh, you have a good business head. I, I want to know what you think of this. Old. Cornelia couldn't change the furniture around without asking. Little things, little things. They had been so sweet when they were little. Granny wished the old days were back again, with the children young and everything to be done over. It had been a hard pull, but not too much for her. When she thought of all the food she had cooked and all the clothes she had cut and sewed and all the gardens she had made, well, the children showed it. There they were, made out of her, and they couldn't get away from that. Sometimes she wanted to see John again and point to them and say, well, I didn't do, do so badly, did I? But that would have to wait. That was for tomorrow. She was used to th uh, think of him as a man, but now all the children were older than their father, and he would be a child beside her if she saw him now. It seemed strange, and there was something wrong in the idea. 
Why, he couldn't possibly recognize her. She had fenced in a hundred acres once, digging the post holes herself and clamping the wires for just a Negro boy to help. That changed a woman. John would be looking for a young woman. With the, with the peaked Spanish comb in her hair and the painted fan, digging post holes changed a woman. Riding country roads in the winter when the women had their babies and it was another thing. Sitting up nights with sick horses and sick Negroes and sick children and hardly ever losing one. John hardly ever lost one of them. John would see that in a minute, and that would be something he could understand. She wouldn't have to explain anything. Oh my gosh, there's a lot in that paragraph. Uh, so it's clearly a lot of insecurity in Granny Weatherall, right? Trying to prove that she's done enough, that she's done enough work, that she's done enough in, in this life. Um, her husband apparently died many years ago. Um, and so, you know, he died when he was younger than her current kids are. Um, he, he must, she must have proved that she did a good enough job without him, without a man. Um, and so then she starts with all these domestic chores, uh, like, you know, cutting cloth and like, you know, they're, they're cut of her cloth. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she then goes into, um, you know, even like fencing and stuff. And then, you know, and then her language there, you know, it's like, oh, Cranny, we don't use that word anymore. Um, you know, things like that really kind of tell us a lot about her. Um, and, you know, she's not going to change. She's pretty stubborn, to say the very least. Uh, but she, but, the, but the big thing I take from here is that she, she has something to prove, like how well she did in raising her kids and so forth. Um, and that, that's really important. And then that pairing, right, of domestic chores with, with raising children, like I made a blouse just like I made Cornelia. Well, then why do you hate Cornelia so much? Um, no, anyways. Uh, all right, I need to pause for a second. It made her feel like rolling up her sleeves and putting the whole place to rights again. No matter if Cornelia was determined to be everywhere at once, uh, there were a great many things left undone on this place. She would start tomorrow and do them. It was good to be strong enough for everything, even if all that you made melted and changed and slipped under your hands, so that by the time you finished, you almost forgot what you were working for. What was it I said to do? She asked herself intently. Uh, but she could not remember. A fog rose over the valley. She saw it marching across the creek, swallowing the trees, moving up the hill like an army of ghosts. Soon it would be at the ed, uh, sorry at the near edge of the orchard, and then it was time to go in and light the lamps. Come in, children. Don't stay out in the night air. All right, so that fog is really important because, you know, it's, it's, it's this physical description is talking about, you know, the environment and things like that, but it's not just there, right? It's in her head, too. Like, she's getting foggy, of course, um, and she's, you know, you know marching, you know, the darkness is marching across the valley. Well, you know, she's also marching towards towards death, right? And so this being the night to the end of the day uh, kind of represents that. And so come in and then the light, right? That's going to be important. You see lights or eyes in, in literature, that's always going to be important, right? So this dark and light thing, light like that, you know? Um, you know, we're really talking about death here. Uh, and that's what this, you know, sort of fog and light and, uh, things represents. Letting the light lamps had been beautiful. The children huddled to her and breathed her little, uh, breathed like little calves waiting at the bars in the twilight. Their eyes followed the match and watched the flame rise and settle in a blue curve. Then they moved away from her. The lamp was lit. They didn't have to be scared and hang on to mother anymore. Never, never, never more. God, for all my life, I thank thee. Without thee, my God, I could never have done it. Hail Mary, full of grace. All right, so now I see that once again, the narrator, narrator is deep in the recesses of Granny Weatherall's mind and is adopting some of that language. Um, and then we see here's, you know, the, the you know, the Catholicism. Right, so some people out there are like, "Oh yeah, hey, I know that," and then others are like, "Oh gosh, you just like my grandma." Um, at any rate, right? There's the Spanish reference here earlier on too, uh, but this it, there's a lot of Catholic prayers that could have been incorporated here. But Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, is what she alludes to directly. Grace, I think, is going to be really, really important in this. Uh, uh, story. Uh, and that's why that specific line was alluded, alluded to. All right. Anyways, um, I want you to pick all the fruit trees and see that nothing, uh, is wasted. There's always someone who can use it. Don't let good things rot for want of using. You waste life when you waste good food. Don't let things get lost. It's better to lose things. Now don't let me get to thinking. Not when I'm tired and taking a little nap before supper. And again, it seems like she's talking about a little bit more than just fruit, right? You know, she is quite bitter, 
What did she lose? The pillow rose about her shoulders and pressed against her heart, and the memory was being squeezed out of it. Oh, push down the pillow, somebody! It would smother her if she tried to hold it. Such a fresh breeze blowing and such a green day with no threats in it. But he had not come, just the same. What does a woman do when she has put on the white veil and set out the white cake for a man and he doesn't come? She tried to remember. No, I swear he never harmed me, but in that. He never harmed me, but in that. And what if he did? There was the day, the day, but a whirl of dark smoke rose and covered it, crept up and dark over the bright field where everything was planned so carefully and orderly rose. That was hell. She knew hell when she saw it. For sixty years she had prayed against remembering him and against losing her soul in the deep pit of hell. And now the two things were mingled in one, and the thought of him was a smoky cloud from hell that moved and crept in her head, and when she just got rid of Dr. Harry was trying to rest a minute. Wounded vanity, Ellen, said a sharp voice at the top of her mind. Don't let your wounded vanity get the upper hand of you. Plenty of girls get jilted. You were jilted, weren't you? Then stand up to it. Her eyelids wavered and let in streamers of blue-gray light like tissue paper over her eyes. She must get up and pull the shades down. Uh, she'd never sleep. She was in bed again, and the shades were not down. How could that happen? Better turn over. Hide from the light. Sleeping in the light gave you nightmares. Mother, how do you feel now? And a stinging wetness on her forehead. But I don't like having my face washed in cold water. Okay, again, another big important paragraph there, where the uh, imagery and physical description actually represents what's going on in Granny Weatherall. Okay, um, and we see that you know maybe some of that harshness that we that that, that she uh, uh, shows us with her attitude towards Cornelia and so forth and so forth is learned, right? Because we have yet another character who's like put in there. We don't know who it is, her mother or what. Saying, yeah, you were jilted. A lot of people get jilted. Get over it, right? But that's a pretty impacting thing, right? And that's just you know, maybe not the best way to deal with it. Just suppress it and let it grow, right? Um, and so there's a lot of ambiguous pronouns throughout the whole paragraph um, in these this con contrasting images, right? The, the the breeze coming in, blowing in the cool breeze, right? The the, the smothering. Um, that's all. Those are all things that could be you know alluding to impending death. Um, and, and then the whole thing about forgiveness, right? She's been trying for 60 years to do it. She can't, um, you know, all, all that's in there. Um, and then she goes right back at the end there to, uh, the cold, the, you know, the wetness, right? I mean, people are crying, uh, and, and maybe she's even remembering her own crying. Uh, and of course the first reaction is to snap back at Cornelia and, and just show that same bitterness that she's had her whole life. I think that, so that grace, then the imagery, then the bitterness that we see displayed here um, tells us a lot about about her and where she came from. And Well, I don't think she ever did forgive. All right. Hapsy, George, Lydia, Jimmy? No, Cornelia. And her features were swollen and full of little puddles. They're coming, darling. They'll all be here soon. Go wash your face, child. You look funny. Again, she didn't get it out, right? Because it doesn't have Instead of obeying, Cornelia knelt down and put her head on the pillow. She seemed to be talking, but there was no sound. Well, are you tongue-tied? Whose birthday is it? Are you going to give a party? So she really doesn't know what's going on here. Right, they're all there, and Cornelia looks funny because she's been crying over her dying mother. And her mother's like, well, is it someone's birthday? Why is everyone here? All right. Cornelia's mouth moved urgently in strange shapes. Don't do that. You bother me, daughter. Oh, no, mother. Oh, no. Nonsense. It was strange about children. They disputed your every word. Now what, Cornelia? Here's Dr. Harry. I won't see that boy again. He just left five minutes ago. That was this morning, Mother. It's night now. Here's the nurse. This is Dr. Harry, Mrs. Weatherall. I never saw you look so young and happy. I'll never be young again, but I'd be happy if they'd let me lie in peace and get rested. She thought she spoke up loudly, but no one answered. A warm weight on her forehead, a warm bracelet on her wrist, and a breeze went whispering trying to tell her something. The shuffle of the leaves in the everlasting hand of God. He blew on them, and they danced and rattled. Mother, don't mind. We're going to give you a little hypodermic. Look here, daughter. How do ants get in this bed? I saw sugar ants yesterday. Did you send for Hapsy, too? It was Hapsy she really wanted. She had to go a long way back through a great many rooms to find Hapsy standing with the baby on her arm. She seemed to herself to be Hapsy also, and the baby on Hapsy's arm was Hapsy, and himself, and herself. All at once, and there was no surprise in the meeting. 
Then Hapsy melted from within and turned flimsy as gray gauze, and the baby was a gauzy shadow. And Hapsy came up close and said, I thought you'd never come, and looked at her searchingly and said, You haven't changed a bit. They leaned forward to kiss when Cornelia began whispering from a long way off, Oh, is there anything you want uh, to tell me? Is there anything I can do for you? Listen, this is also another crazy little paragraph as we're going through the stream of consciousness and uh, Granny Weatherall is going back in the recesses of her mind, right? Uh, where it says she had to go a long way back through great many rooms, right? And they're, they're using that physical house to actually talk about her head, right? She had to go back through many memories to find Hapsy. So apparently Hapsy's not around anymore. But Hapsy, it seems, was the, the kid that Granny Weatherall really wanted. Right? She doesn't like Cornelia, but she likes Hapsy. And then there's this image here of her with the the daughter Hapsy, then 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 Hapsy with a little kid. Um, and you know, if, if you go back to the Hail Mary full of grace line, uh, you know, this, this could be it, it sounds a lot like that image of Mary with, with the baby Jesus. Um, and but but Hapsy's not there. And so this potential for grace and forgiveness is not there, and thus sixty years later she still can't forgive the guy. Um, all right. Uh, so anyways, um, it also shows that she's not um, cognizant of when it is. You know, if, if, if she's like calling out for Hapsy and things like this and, you know, Hapsy's not been there in many years. Um, all right. Yes, she had changed her mind after 60 years and she would like to see George. I want you to find George. Find him and be sure to tell him I forgot him. I want him to know I had my husband just the same and my children in my house like any other good woman. A good house, too, and a good husband that I loved and fine children out of him. Better than I hoped for, even. Tell him I was given back everything he took away and more. Oh, no. Oh, God, no. There was something else besides the house and the man and the children. Oh, surely they were not all. What was it? Something not given back. Her breath crowded down under her ribs and grew into a monstrous frightening shape with cutting edges and bored up into her head, and the agony was unbelievable. Yes, John, get the doctor now. No more talk. My time has come. All right. So, you know, what is that thing that wasn't given back? Right. Um, there's some, you know, there's some part of her that was taken away, and it's not tangible like the house and the kids because of this. It's something much, much deeper. Is it soul? Is it the ability to forgive? Something along these lines. It is something monstrous, though. When this one was born, it should be the last. The last. It should have been born first, for it was the one she had truly wanted. Everything came in good time. Nothing left out, left over. She was strong. In three days, she would be as well as ever. Better. A woman needed milk in her to have full health. Mother, do you hear me? I've been telling you. Mother, Father Connolly is here. I went to Holy Communion only last week. Tell him I'm not all so sinful as that. Father just wants to speak to you. He could speak as much as he pleased. It was like him to drop in and inquire about her soul as if he were, it were a teething baby and then stay on for a cup of tea and a round of cards and gossip. He always had a funny story of some sort, usually about an Irishman who made his little mistakes and confessed them, and the point lay in some absurd thing he would blurt out in a confessional, showing his struggles between native piety and original sin. Granny felt easy about her soul. Cornelia, where are your manners? Give Father Connolly a chair. She had her secret comfortable understanding with a few favorite saints who cleared up a straight road to God for her. Weird. Um... And so, once again, all right, so the, the, the priest is here for last rites. And so, you know, if you know what that is, it's the it's Catholic belief that you have to, like, um, kind of confess or go through one last uh, little bit of confession on your deathbed in order to make it into heaven. And she says, well, why is he here? I just, you know, went last week. And they're like, well, it's, it's for last rites. It's because you're, you're about to die. Um, and, but then it's, it, seemed, it, it sounds like, in that last sentence I read, she had her secret comfortable understanding with a few favorite saints who cleared a straight road to God for her. Like, she's trying to manipulate her way into heaven. Like, there's some, she's got some back road way. Uh, so why wouldn't she go, right? Is it that bitterness and forgiveness that's still there? Spoiler. Um, all as surely signed and sealed as the papers for the new 40 acres. Forever. Heirs and assigns forever. Since the day the wedding cake was not cut. Man, she's really focused on that day when she was jilted. <laughs> but thrown and out and wasted. The whole bottom dropped out of the world, and there she was, blind and sweating, with nothing under her feet, and the walls falling away. His hand had caught her under the breast. She had not fallen. There was the freshly polished floor with the green rugget on it, just as before. 
He had cursed like a sailor's parrot and said, I'll kill him for you. Don't lay a hand on him for my sake. Leave something, something to God. Now, Ellen, you must believe what I tell you. So that there was nothing, nothing to worry about anymore, except sometimes in the night one of the children screamed in a nightmare, and they both hustled out, shaking and hunting for the matches and calling. There, wait a minute. Here we are. John, get the doctor now. Hapsy's time has come. But there was Hapsy standing by the bed in a white cap. Cornelia, tell Hapsy to take her off her cap. I can't see her plain. Her eyes opened very wide, and the room stood out like a pic picture she had seen somewhere. Dark colors with the shadows rising toward the ceiling in long angles. The tall black dresser gleamed with nothing on it. The John's picture enlarged from a little one, with John's eyes very black when they should be have been blue. You never saw him. So how do you know how he looked? But the man insisted the copy was perfect. It was very rich and handsome. For a picture, yes, but it's not my husband. The table by the bed had a linen cover and a candle and a crucifix. The light was blue from Cornelia's silk lampshades. No sort of light at all, just frippery. You had to live 40 years with kerosene lamps to appreciate honest electricity. She felt very strong, and she saw Dr. Harry with a rosy nimbus around him. Um, and, and so what you'll see here is just, there's more and more of the, the crucifix that it brought to, to talk about the, uh, the halo here. There's a sort of iconography uh, you know, that we associate with like forgiveness. And, and, and so perhaps it's that you know, um, she doesn't feel forgiven or she feels like she hasn't forgiven. Uh, but, the, but it is in here quite a bit. And this whole bit about the picture, it's pretty vague and, and, and hard to figure out because, of course, we're in a stream of conscious point of view inside uh, this old woman's mind who can't like quite stay lucid. Um, and so, so maybe, you know, it's that she got a, a, a picture painted or a photograph taken of, of John, her husband. But then she says, that's not my husband. Because in, you know, deep inside her, uh, it's not John that she loves. Right, it's George, but she, she still wants that jilting is still affecting her, and she still wants that life. All right, you look like a saint, Dr. Harry, and I have all that's as near as you'll ever come to it. <laughs> Just when you were starting to sympathize with Granny Weatherall, uh, there comes that bitterness again. She's saying something. I heard you, Cornelia. What's all this carrying on? Father Colony's saying, Cornelia's voice staggered and bumped like a cart on a bad road. It rounded corners and turned back again and arrived nowhere. Granny stepped up in the cart very lightly and reached for the reins, but a man sat beside her, and she knew him by his hands. Driving the cart, she did not look in his face, for she knew without saying, but looked instead down the road where the trees leaned over and bowed to each other, and a thousand birds were singing a mass. She felt like singing, too, but she put her hand in the bosom of her dress and pulled out a rosary, and Father kindly murmured Latin in a very solemn voice and tickled her feet. "'My God, will you stop that nonsense? I'm a married woman!' What if he did run away and leave me to face the priest by myself? I found another in a whole world better. I wouldn't have exchanged my husband for anybody except St. Michael himself, and you may tell him that for me with a thank you in the bargain. All right, and so once again, um, more of the you know, uh, Catholic influence there with you know, St. Michael as kind of the, the protector and so forth. Um, and then, but the, the person, the familiar hands driving the cart, um, you know, she's known a lot of death in her life. Uh, you know, her husband, John, died. Her favorite daughter, Hapsy, died. And so that, that could be referring uh, to death, who is often personified as, um, or was at least, as you know, the figure in the big black robe driving uh, uh, a cart drawn by the four horsemen, right? And so maybe that's what, what she's referencing here, is, uh, you know, death is, is coming in. There's this parallelism going on. All right. And so dark and light once again to show like life and death. Light flashed on closed eyelids, and a deep roaring shook her. Cornelia, is that lightning? I hear thunder. There's going to be a storm. Close all the windows. Call the children in. Mother, here we are, all of us. Is that you, Hapsy? Oh no, I'm Lydia. We drove as fast as we could. Their faces drifted above her and drifted away. The rosy fell out of her hands, and Lydia put it back. Jimmy tried to help. Their hands fumbled together. And Granny closed two fingers around Jimmy's thumb. Bees won't do. It must be something alive. She was so amazed her thoughts ran around and around. So, my dear Lord, this is my death, and I wasn't even thinking about it. My children have come to see me die. But I can't. It's not time. Oh, I always hated surprises. I wanted to give Cordelia the amethyst set. Cordelia, uh, you're going to have the amethyst set, but Hapsy's to wear it when she wants. And Dr. Harry, do shut up. Nobody sent for you. 
Oh, my dear Lord, do wait a minute. I meant to do something about the 40 acres. Jimmy doesn't need it, and Lydia will later on with that worthless husband of hers. I meant to finish the altar cloth and send six bottles of wine to Sister Borgia for his, her dyspepsia. I want to send six bottles of wine to Sister Borgia, Father Connolly. Now don't let me forget. Cornelia's voice made short turns and tilted over and crashed. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. Oh, mother. I'm not going, Cornelia. I'm taken by surprise. I can't go. You'll see Hapsy again. What about her? I thought you'd never come. Granny made a long journey outward, looking for Hapsy. What if I don't find her? What then? Her heart sank down and down. There was no bottom to death. She couldn't come to the end. Of it. <laughs> Sorry. The blue light from Cornelia's lampshade drew into a tiny point in the center of her brain. It flickered and wrinkled like an eye. Uh, quietly, it fluttered and dwindled. Granny lay curled down within herself, amazed and watchful, staring at the point of light that was herself. Her body was now only a deeper mass of shadow and an endless darkness, and in this darkness would curl around the light and swallow it up. God, give a sign! For the second time, there was no sign. Again, no bridegroom and the priest in the house. She could not remember any other sorrow because this grief wiped them all away. Oh no, there's nothing more cruel than this. I'll never forgive it. She stretched herself with a deep breath and blew out the light. All right, so right there, Granny Weatherall dies. Now, if you go back up to the title, remember it's called The Jilting of Granny Weatherall. And certainly the, the story is about the, the deep impact that this moment had on her life. Um, but the focus of the story is this last paragraph here, where she finally dies. Um, and she dies with the words, I'll never forgive it, no grace, right? Um, and with the light going out, right? There's light there, but then she doesn't end at it. And she doesn't find Hapsi, she's looking for it, right? So this jilting at the end here is her not getting into heaven. And, and, that, and that comes from, so you have all the, the Catholic references there. Um, it's, it's a Catholic, and other churches have this, this similar belief too, that Jesus is the bridegroom. There's several places in the New Testament that, that mention that. Um, and we, or the church, are the bride, as the, uh, the theory goes. Um, and in Christ's death, he effectively married, you know, us. Um, not in like a weird way, just like in a weird metaphysical way. Um, at, 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 at any rate, um, She's likening that moment when her soul died, when she was jilted at the altar by George 60 years ago, with this moment when she's waiting for you know, Jesus to take her into heaven, and he doesn't show up either. And, and that's really the great fear, that she'll never see Hapsi again, that she'll, she, she, she won't make it into heaven. Um, and it really becomes like a kind of really sad story, even though it's hard to like Granny Weatherall, right? She's, you know, got some uh, not so nice opinions and things. Um, you know, you, you do experience a, a variety here. Like, you, you still don't want that for her, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, there's allusions and figure of language and imagery uh, and the stream of consciousness and all these things going to characterize her. All that untagged speech is a, is a form of characterizing her with those very specific and, and antiquated phrasings and things. Um, but also, I, I think this uh, can tap into uh, common experiences and memories. And that's one of the points here. So as I, if I read this, I remember a story from my life. Now, it's not something that I would write about uh, in the analytical paper, like on the exam, but it's a good thing to think about, maybe even add it to my annotations, because um, some of the things associated with that experience and that, and that story and that, some of those emotions um, can be applied here. So here it is. When I was in high school, uh, we lived in this apartment. And uh, my, mo my mom was at work and my brother and I were at home. I was working on homework. I think he was like playing Sega Genesis or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, there, there was this, um, this old couple that lived in the apartment next door. And so we shared a wall. And um, the old woman had dementia and she was losing it. And we would hear her like yelling for her daughter all the time, usually not in very nice tones. Um, and we knew that her daughter wasn't there, didn't even live in the, in the town anymore. Um, and it was kind of annoying. And she would smoke, and then we'd smell it. Like, ah, it's like a bitter old woman who's always like making noise and smoking. Um, you know, so you know, we didn't have a lot of love for her. Uh, the, then one day, or we're sitting around doing my homework, and she just keeps yelling for her daughter again, and that's not unusual. We've heard that many times. But she starts yelling and saying, "You know, I can't get the smoke out." And we're like, "What? Ah, she's smoking again, whatever." And then, but like an hour later, she's doing it again. Like, just keep just keeps yelling it. We're like. Something must not be right. And then we start smelling. We're like, 
that doesn't smell like cigarette smoke. And so we ended up going over there and her, her garbage can is all aflame. And so I yell at my brother to open the door and I kick it out the door and the carpet's on fire. And so I stamp out the carpet. Um, and it's really fortunate because we waited much more of the carpet bar would have uh, really, you know, taken off and, 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 and burned up. Um, and of course, that was a big epith- epiphany for the husband, you know, about how long he could leave her alone and things like this. Um, but I look over and, and there's this little old woman who's like bitter and um, not very nice uh, and just like crying, like snot coming down her you know, her upper lip and stuff like that. And um, just kind of realize like how difficult this must be to, to just like lose your mind like that. Um, and, you know, had a very different perspective and a bit of an, an epiphany there. Um, and uh, so anyways, you know, this, this bitter old woman in here kind of reminds me there that like you can have uh, in dislike aspects of a person and not like their, their bitterness and things like that, but then also have sympathy at the same time. Um, I think that's one of the things that, uh, the characterization of Granny Weatherall um, is getting at, and of course, there's a, there's that message about like you know you got to forgive and move on, uh, or it will stay with you your whole life, and perhaps even later, uh, as we see with Granny who can't forgive George, sixty years later and even into death. Um, so that's a bit of a bummer. <laughs> uh, we do read a lot of sad things this year, but not not everything. But yeah, I guess most things. Um, all right, so I, I, I hope you tracked a little bit. Uh, and you saw some of that imagery, you saw some of the characterization going on there. Um, and uh, if you didn't like it, don't worry. Uh, there's a lot, there's going to be a variety of different stories that, that you like throughout the year. Um, but uh, hope you, thanks for, if you made it this far, thank you for getting to the end.